Hi, everybody. We'll get started. Um, it's, it's great to be here with you, um, and welcome to our Room 217 Music Care webinar series. Uh, my name is Dawn Ellis Mobs, and I'm the Education Manager with Room 217. We're very excited today to uh, offer our webinar, which is Making Music in Adult Day Programs with Ruth Watkiss. And I'd just like to mention that all of our webinars are free thanks to the generous support of the George Lunin Foundation. So just a few housekeeping items. Um, we are going to uh, ask that everybody remain muted and keep your uh, videos off for the duration of the presentation. And uh, today's webinar will last for an hour, and it will include a Q&A session during the last few minutes. As the presentation unfolds, please feel free to send me through the chat, which is the bar located at the bottom of your screen, any burning questions that you'd like to ask Ruth at the end. Um, I'll moderate the Q&A at the end and uh, we'll field those questions that you have to Ruth. Um, also, for those of you that may be taking this webinar um, as a continuing education credit, um, if you'd like a certificate for that, you can email us at info at musiccare.org. Again, for those of you looking for your certificate for continuing ed credit, info at musiccare.org. So um, before we get into uh, introducing Ruth and, and her presentation or a portion of the presentation, we have some really exciting uh, Room 217 uh, actually news for this fall. And so in addition, yeah, there we go. We, in addition to our um, webinar schedule, which happens the second Wednesday of every month, again, offered free to everybody, we have an extra webinar uh, topic in two weeks on a very, very exciting um, new Music Care Connect app by our operations manager, Kenna Kozak. And, and so again, pretty exciting stuff happening at Room 217. Um, we have taken a deeper dive into the world of technology and actually created a Music Care Connect app, which will give you access to Room 217 music and programs 24-7. And as you can see, it's accessible by uh, downloading it from the Apple Store or by Google Play. And if we've tweaked your curiosity, you can find out more information about the Music Care Connect app via our brand new website, which is musiccare.org. And that's right, we also have a new website as our organization underwent a rebranding that was released or launched on October 1st. And in addition to some of our offerings over the summer and then released this fall, we have new webinars. Um, one is Ukuleles for Care that was released on September 15th. And we will be releasing Bells for Care and Music and the Developing Brain later this, uh, later this fall. And as always, after pivoting uh, into the world of virtual programming, like many of us have, we are thrilled to announce that we will continue to offer our music care training virtually this season. This will make training accessible from wherever you are. And if you'll notice, you can still join us, although rather short notice, but you can join us October 15, 16, this Friday, Saturday for music care level one. As well, we're offering level two on November 19th and 20th. And again, we now have a new certify program and you can become or music care training leads to the opportunity to become music care certified and again you can discover more about that on our website musiccare.org and so the main event today in today's webinar Ruth will lead us through a session on making music in adult day programs this presentation will show you how the Alzheimer's Society of Peel created a thriving music community She'll tell us about her music committee, who was involved, what they accomplished, what their plans are, and how we can be inspired to create our own music advocacy teams by following their example. Ruth herself is a certified music therapist who has dedicated her career to empowering individuals living with dementia through the power of music. Over 16 years ago, Ruth began to create a music therapy program at the Alzheimer's Society of Peel. The program has expanded and currently provides the five day programs and respite house with group and individual music therapy sessions, personalized listening, memories to music and raising voices. 
the Alzheimer's Society of Peel now has a thriving music com community, which includes a music committee composed of music care trained staff members who advocate for music for our clients and members. Ruth, thank you for being with us today. We look forward to hearing your story. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to share uh, some information about our music community here at the Alzheimer's Society Peel. And um, I would like to thank the Music Care for having me today, um, inviting me to do this webinar. Um, I love any excuse to talk about my, our music program at the Alzheimer's Society Peel. It's usually getting me to stop. So we'll see, hopefully I can, <laughs> you know, not go over our time limit here today. Um, so I, to start off today, um, I'm going to um, share a little bit about our story at the Alzheimer's Society Peel, where we began um, and where we are now and where we're going to go while sharing some tips and ideas that I've learned along the way. So I hope we, you can use some of um, our musical journey to help you build your own thriving music community. And as I share our journey, you'll see a, this quick tips image where I think I've learned something that I can pass along to others wanting to create this community. Um, at the end of the uh, presentation, you'll be receiving an email with a handout which has a hard copy of the quick tips. Um, so you can feel free to take notes and you'll get those written down for you later in a summary fashion. All right, so, oops, my slides work, there we go. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of history of the Alzheimer's Society Peel. So we were incorporated in 1983 as a charitable nonprofit society. And since that time, our chapter has diligently worked to support families and individuals affected by Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And we serve the region of Peel for our offices in Brampton and Mississauga. Our mission statement states, the Alzheimer's Society Peel exists to alleviate the personal and social consequences of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias to help find the cause, prevention, and cure. We have a variety of different services available for people living with dementia. We have the First Link Program, Behavioral Supports Ontario. We have a bathing program, dementia education for care partners and the community. We offer counseling services. We have respite care at Nora's house. We have five adult day programs and um, providing day program services and virtual programming created during COVID um, that is still continuing to this day. So in our five day programs, we have uh, the Sam McCallion program, which is in South Mississauga. Um, we have the Brampton Day Center in Brampton. Metavale is in North Mississauga. Brunel, Central Mississauga, and our most recent program is Evelyn's Place Day program, which is also housed in the same building as our Brampton Day Center. All our programs provide services from seven to seven with staff specially trained to care for and be sensitive to the needs of the families we serve. All our centers are specially adapted for individuals with cognitive impairments who are unable to attend traditional community and social programs. All clients must be assessed by the management for suitability and must schedule visits. Members typically attend our day programs two to three times a week. Um, we have wait lists up to 18 months to two years for day program services. So if we do two to three days a week, um, more people can get the services. Our Evelyn's Day uh, Evelyn's Place Day program is um, our newest program and it has a unique feature. It has a drop-in feature, which is more flexible uh, attendance for our members. Um, this can be utilized for people who have appointments or to help someone become more familiar with day program before they come in. So my journey um, and my focus of my work is within these day programs. So when I started at the Alzheimer's Society Peel, we only had three day programs. And this <laughs> crazy to think about it, but it was 17 years ago. I started as a summer student working at the Brampton site, providing music students while I was working towards my Bachelor of Music Therapy degree at the University of Windsor. So I went back to school for eight months, and then the next year I was back, and I haven't left since then. <laughs> um, I completed one of my placements, my university placements at the Brampton site, followed by my internship. I completed my thousand hour internship part-time at the Brampton Day Center and part-time at Baycrest under Amy Clements-Cortez. Once I completed my 
internship, I was hired part time as a music therapist traveling between the three day programs. And I was also con I contracted out to the Sandalwood Village Park in Brampton and Highborn Life Care Center in Etobicoke. As the society grew, so did my role. And soon we had four day programs and then five day pro programs. We also added into my rotation visiting Nora's house, our respite care house, two times a week. And so by 2014, I was working full time at the Alzheimer's Society Peel, and I was providing music therapy services to over 125 clients a week. So my typical day at the day program includes doing a large group sing along program in the morning, it kind of sets the mood for the day. And then at the end of the day, we do a large music trivia style program for everybody. And then in between those big programs, I will run three smaller programs, which are each 45 minutes in length. And so these are with a select group of members. Uh, members are assessed and scheduled into the groups. Um, they'll be grouped with people who have similar goals, similar interests, or similar cognitive abilities. Depending on the needs and the goals of the programs, um, the program could be a, a down memory lane program, which is a musical reminiscence program where we use themes and music to stimulate memory and discussion. It could be a bell choir program, which is a musically creative program where we create music together and we've even gone and performed at other places. A drum circle program where it's a very musically active program joining together to create um, to create music. Uh, musical bingo program is a cognitive based music program which is created to stimulate themed discussion and music appreciation. I have a move, move to the music program, so this is a mu musical exercise program designed to encourage easy movement to music through instrument playing or um, uh, actions associated with music and a musical stimulation program, so this is a program that uh, is more experiential and it's designed for members who are less mobile and who need more support. Within the day programs, we also had a personalized listening program for our members. So this was created for people who needed more or less stimulation throughout the day. Maybe they needed a distraction at times when they were starting to get anxious or to prevent, you know, um, some known behaviors throughout the day, such as, you know, we knew that someone was getting anxious or exit seeking throughout the end of the day, um, we could use our playlists. Uh, we are also very honored to be uh, participating in three community programs here at the ASP. Our first program is Memories to Music. So this began in 2009. It's an intergenerational music legacy program that runs every year with Mentor College. Senior level high school music students are provided with education on dementia and communication, and they're then paired with day program members. Together, this group spends four 45 minute sessions getting to know each other through interviews and musical activities. And once the sessions are complete, the students are tasked with composing a song about their partner. This song is then recorded and performed at a concert uh, at the end of the program with, where we invite family and friends. This song acts as a legacy for the day program members. And this program has been featured in the Toronto Star. Raising Voices is another community program we uh, helped create. This is an intergenerational choir created for people living with dementia and their care partners. The Mississauga Festival Choir approached um, us in 2015, wanting to create a choir for people with dementia in our community. So together we created Raising Voices. The choir has a variety of members, including individuals living with dementia, their care partners, seasoned singers from the Mississauga Festival Choir and high school vocal students from Cawthor Park Secondary School. To participate in the program, all community volunteers must attend an education session on dementia provided by us. And then we pair off one Mississauga Festival Choir singer, one student with an individual with dementia and his or her care partner. And this grouping sits together for rehearsals um, and creates a bond within our eight weeks that we rehearse together. At the end of the eight weeks, we have two concerts. So our one concert is just for our family and friends. And then we go on the road and we perform for a local retirement home. Now this program was featured um, recently on CTV and Rogers local cable channel, whatever that one is called, I forget. <laughs> um, 
Our final community program is the most recent addition to our lineup. So during the program, um, the um, Alzheimer's Society Peel was approached by the Toronto Symphony Orchestra to participate in virtual concerts with their musicians. So uh, we had seven concerts a week by uh, professional musicians who performed for one to three members. Um, and the, our members had a private uh, concert within their own home. So now that the TSO is back to rehearsing and performing, we unfortunately can't have seven concerts a week, which we would love, but <laughs> we can't. So we're still hoping to have two concerts a week. And then those concerts would take place actually within our day program. And so this program is featured on CTV. Now, <laughs> I'm not just bragging about the publicity aspect of these programs. Um, I'm just a little bit bragging because they're fantastic programs, but this public publicity aspect has been a huge part of getting the support of our senior leadership team. And that support from that senior leadership team is what enables us to have such a thriving music community. So over the years, I mean, I, I've I've applied for grants and sponsors for many of our and for many of our programs. Um, our Memories to Music program was funded by a New Horizons grant by Home Instead and the continued support of Mentor College. Our Personalized Listening program was funded by the Community Foundation of Mississauga, and the Branson Caledon Community Foundation. Raising Voices was funded by the Retired Teachers of Ontario Foundation and the Benefit and Pension Administration because music is this buzzword right now. We all know, especially within dementia care, music is just, it's, it's a real, you know, everyone is starting to learn how much power music has. And a community program that creates those, those that you can, um, that makes hearts warm, that makes people getting those warm, fuzzy feelings, that makes people pick up the phone and, you know, call or text or email your CEO and say, hey, I saw you on the news or you know, anything like that is huge in getting support from that senior, senior level team to support your program. And also um, uh, another tip is that if you get a grant or a sponsor, it's sometimes required that you have to have show proof of a program working, but regardless of whether that's required, it is always a great idea to create a brief, brief qualitative study to gather some information um that you can provide to your sponsor or stakeholder so a survey could be just creating you know how did you feel before and after um, something that captures a snapshot of the mood of the participants um, getting permission of course to always make sure that any information you get is going to can be shared um, but get permission also to take photos or videos of people enjoying the program or of testimonials of the program something to show how much people how much joy your program is bringing to people and make sure that your sponsors, your stakeholders, your senior leadership team, everybody can see these little uh, heartwarming little stories and is, has been the, one of the biggest things that has supported our program from the very beginning. So as I was becoming more involved in the community programs, our frontline client services were getting a little less of me. So, we wanted to uh, be able to have a quality music program at the day program and Nora's house, even when I wasn't on site. You know, one day a week was the music day because Ruth was there. We needed, we wanted to do more than that. So we'd been noticing that in the last few years that a lot of our music programs that we are using were not as appropriate for our members in our, in our day program anymore. Recordings from Elder Song were our members par parents generation songs from world war ii like it's a long way to tipperary were no longer enjoyed by everyone you'd have a group who were you know in their late 80s and 90s who really loved that music but we were also having people in the day program who are 50. people who are coming in and they're requesting me uh, requesting zz top music and abba so we really well, decided um we were seeing that we really wanted to modernize our music programs while also managing the growing multicultural aspect of music, which was becoming so much more important in the region of Peel, which is a hugely diverse city. So we tried a few of the packaged music programs. We drive a music club. I created a few of my own, like musical bingo. And these programs all included recording of songs along with discussion guidance. But these packaged programs were not 
as successful as we wanted them to be. They started off with lots of enthusiasm, but that quickly waned. So I reached out to um, our staff in our day programs in Nora's house and to, to see why, you know, what was, what was happening? Why were these programs not being as successful as they knew they could be? So um, some of the staff said that the turnover of staff, of other staff was just so high. The new staff weren't un didn't understand how important the instructions were and following the process of what had been created. So like, you know, why we do things the way we're doing them within the program. Um, and those instructions also didn't include enough information about why the programs should be run a certain way. You know, the focus was on the discussion and the focus was on the uh, validation of people's experiences in the world, their life experiences and their feelings rather than, you know, going to the next part, next song or moving on. Staff were also saying that they were just too busy. Um, in the our day programs, our frontline staff, they write and they run programs, they cook meals, they assist in all forms of personal care. They're just so busy when they're on the floor. And I had to thank some of the staff because they were open with me and they said that they were intimidated by my, you know, I come in with my guitar and I'm singing and they were intimidated by my ability saying, well, they can't, because they couldn't sing like me, they didn't want to lead music or they didn't want to do, you know, a music program. And it didn't matter how many times I said that, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to know how to sing to lead a music program. You know, you don't have to, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more about the energy and the fun and the experience, I, the message, I, I just wasn't getting the message across. So I kind of reflected on all this information and I realized, I needed to get my, my colleagues more invested in music and music programming. I had to get them excited and I had to get them empowered. So we came up, yep, that's our slide. <laughs> so we came up with a new plan. We decided we were going to have one person from each of our day programs, one person, our day programs and Nora's house who was the music therapy representative. So the idea was that this person was going to be the voice for me and music advocacy at each site. So I was really hopeful that this was going to be a staff member who was, who volunteered, who believed in music. Uh, we all know the difference on how much we enjoy what we're doing if we are, if we actually volunteer or if we were voluntold to do that. So I was really hoping this would be someone who was looking forward to this, pro this role and excited about it. And another key point that we had was that we included music therapy as a standing item on meetings. So in ev because I had that representative at each site, um, I had a voice at each meeting. So every time there was a team meeting, the st a staff member, music was brought up. So and that was really helped the, the visibility of the program. And having that enthusiastic staff helping me just like, uh, this is a huge, you know, quick tip is having um, passionate people, passionate and enthusiastic music people come together. And this was our first step towards this. So I did a brief training with the music therapy rep included an overview of music programming, um, when the music therapist is absent, you know, that this person would be running my program. So how do they run um, this person, you know, how to communicate updates. Um, and this person, this rep was also responsible for passing along recruitment information for raising voices, arranging other programs like our drum circle program. Um, but the two biggest roles that we asked this individual to this music rep to do was the personalized listening program and our memories to music lead. So I was being requested um, to do personalized listening playlists or iPod playlists um, for people who I'd never met because I'm only at each program one day a week. There's so many other people within the day program that I didn't didn't know. And I realized like, why am I making these playlists for people? This is not you know, these, these could be easily done by, you know, my colleagues, because they know the members so much better. So we did a little training on how best to create these playlists. And we created a system where the, one of my frontline colleagues would create the playlist, they would send it to me, and I'd have a little look at it. And then this playlist was commuted, communicated to the team. And so it's in the meeting minutes, it was being talked about at the minutes and all got all the team on board 
for how these iPods or these playlists were supposed to be used. So here's an example on the screen here of what our individualized playlist instructions look like. So we, we communicated to our team as why the reason, the why we were using a personalized playlist, whether it was for, you know, um, stimulation or distraction, or because someone had a, was experiencing a particular behavior at some time, um, what the recommended listening schedule was so that everybody was on board to utilize the music, use the music in the, in the same way, and what we are trying to accomplish with this. Because this was brought up at these meetings, and it was put in the minutes, everybody was on board with these. And because it was a um, one of the staff members who was there every day who created the program, they were able to encourage the rest of the staff to use them and use them in the way that they were created. And they also, you know, as the, because the staff were the ones who created it, they of course were invested in helping asking everyone else to to use them because nobody likes to put work into a project and then it not be used. Another role for the uh, music therapy rep was the memories to music lead. So previously, before we came up with this idea, the recruitment, communication, teaching, leading, everything memories to music was all on me. We passed on a lot of those um, tasks to the rest of the team so that the, the representatives and it worked so much better because they already had the relationships with the staff, with the families. But I also gave the staff opportunities to come into the school and teach with me, teach the students about dementia and communication. Um, I also, they were also given the opportunity to take a more active role in leading the music activities. And this ended up being a bit of a double-edged sword because uh, the staff were able to have these other experiences and then they actually went on and they left uh, Frontline and they moved on to doing counseling or behavioral supports Ontario. So they actually like let, went, moved on further in the company, which left me having to have find more staff. But at the same time, it sent the message of the importance of music on into the rest of the company. And so uh, people now in behavioral supports Ontario and in counseling and, you know, all the way up the chain all have had no there's always someone in there who's taken the music training and knows how important music is. So in 2018, I signed up our five adult day programs for what a difference a day makes program with music care. Music care had this great program called pathways and um, the what a difference a day make enabled adult day programs to get the pathways program for free if all staff participated in the training tutorials and if we would provide feedback and research to music care. Little did I know at the time that uh, this was a bit of a, this was a turning point for our music community. So this is where I really started to see a, you know, a solution to some of the challenges we've been experiencing in getting music as a, as a um, more utilized and more understood within the day programs and Nora's house. So although the music therapy, therapy representative and was the co-lead with myself at each site for the Pathways program, all staff who were participating in Pathways had to take the music care tutorials. They were YouTube tutorials. There was one on understanding dementia, one on why singing works in memory care. There were three videos on how Pathways specifically worked. And then there was a program uh, video on strengthening relationships through Pathways. And it really was the second video, why singing works in memory care and what's the evidence that really started to be this aha moment for me. So I've been conducting in services for years, but my presentations always seem to focus more on the, the music therapy process at ASP rather than the power of music and the fundamentals of music. And I think that this was the key piece that I was missing. I knew something was missing, but I didn't, know what it was and it wasn't until staff watched these videos and came to me and they were like Ruth we didn't know music could do that or wow you know we didn't know that this could happen and I was like um well I obviously have missed something because I just oh don't it doesn't everybody know that I just I just missed it completely and there was so much excitement and questions coming from the team that it was really exciting for me to be like oh, I think this is, this is what I've, you know, 
this is what I'm missing. So it was at this point that I started looking at what other education music care provided. I didn't have the ability to create anything at this point. I had so much on my plate. So music care training seemed to be the perfect thing, but we couldn't do it. We just didn't, we couldn't get it into our day programs. We couldn't have that many staff on off the floor at once to do training. And we just couldn't see how, so we just kind of got put on a back burner. But sometimes there are a few glimmers of hope in trouble and the pandemic provided the ASP frontline staff with some downtime. So through COVID, we were running virtual programs, but our day programs and our, our respite house were closed. So we had a little more time to take some of our education. And I saw that Music Care was now providing their music certification program online. They had a discount, which for five or more staff members, if they registered, we got a discount. So I sent an email to everyone and I had, you know, anyone interested in this? And I had three staff come back and they were three staff from three different programs. And I was like, oh, maybe. <laughs> so I wrote a little proposal to senior leadership team to see if they would support getting a staff from each site trained in music care. I thought it was a great idea. So we did a push for the staff to register. And in the end, we had 14 uh, client service and respite service workers trained in level one and two from music care. The results of this were, you know, all that I have hoped they would be. Um, not only were staff more knowledgeable about the fundamentals of music and all its amazing effects, but they were excited about their own ideas. One of the things I loved about the music care um, program was that each staff had to come up with their own initiative. So these were projects that the participants wanted to achieve, wanted to um, do within their workplace or volunteer or whatever, something they wanted to do with their training. And so the um, staff, you know, had all these, were all excited about their own ideas because, and they were all invested. And I could see this confidence growing in them because they knew that they could run a program and it wasn't about just about singing. It wasn't just about creating music in the moment. And, and it wasn't just about what I did that what they could do so much more with music. So I really think that that huge part of education um, and giving people the confidence through that education, something I missed for years has been just so key in our music community. So while we were actually taking the music care course, I took, I was there as well. And we, um, I set up a little chat room where we were chatting um, and uh, about what we were doing, what we were see doing in the course. And one of the staff said, we should do a music committee where all the people from all this training come together and share that, I share our ideas. And well, I was very, of course, nerdily excited. I was <laughs> very excited. This became my initiative. So I went to senior leadership team and I said, you know, the staff came up with this idea and I think it's so great. How can we do this? You know, are you on board? Can we create a music committee? And leadership team thought that this was such an awesome, awesome idea to just keep with the momentum of, and the excitement. How can you say no to a team when they're so excited? So we created this committee and it's chaired by myself and we with a management representative and we be, we meet monthly. But I think the important part here is that although I chair it, this is not my community. It's not the music therapist community. This is a music committee. This is the staff's initiative. And I was just the voice to help put it in place. So my role within the group is to facilitate and to be the music expert, which allows me to be a resource for other people. And it allows the other staff to go further than they would than if they were on their own. Knowing that they have that support and they have the resources helps them, everyone else to do more than they would beforehand. So I really strongly recommend if you're going to try and have an initiative where you bring people together, having some kind of music expert on your team. So, you know, as a music therapist or music care practitioner, someone can, who can be that voice and that resource for the staff, because it was, um, um, which, you know, just from my experience, it, it's, it really is very important. So our first job as our music committee was to create a pop purpose, outcome and process. So we wanted to unite as a team advocating for music throughout the Alzheimer's Society appeal 
and create a standard of music care across all our sites. We wanted to achieve this by team cohesiveness and creating a consistent availability of music resources across the sites. So accessibility to all in a single resource. And we wanted to achieve this by providing a platform for open communication in a safe environment, open discussion and identifying the needs and assigning actions and tasks. So our main goal was to raise the bar of music programming and knowledge throughout our day programs and respite house. We wanted to have better quality sing-alongs, more resources, more music programming, and music that was more age appropriate and culturally relevant to our members. We wanted to take an inventory of all the music resources at all our sites and bring them together in one place to share them. And we also wanted to find a way to, you know, bring to life our music care initiatives that we had been working on in the course. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about our some of our projects that we were working on. So um, Amara and Carol had uh, a similar music care initiative in that they wanted to create a more multicultural music resource. So this is one of the first resources we were able to really start work on, the first goals we were able to work on. The region of Peel is extremely multicultural. We have, um, and the music from each culture, country, religion, and language is very different. And we wanted to create playlists for as many of these different um, cultures, countries, languages, religions as we could and have them accessible to all our staff to use when we might need them. So we began tapping it by tapping into the multiculturalism of our music committee. We had music committee members from a huge variety of backgrounds. We had Filipino, Chinese, French, Italian, Jamaican, Polish, English, and more just even within our community. Then we did a survey of all our current members and we highlighted which were the most common backgrounds. We found out those were Italian, German, and Filipino. We, so we decided to focus on those first, but then we reached out to all the 150 staff members at the ASP and we asked them to help us build the date, database as well. We have, we have you know, these huge resources right in front of us and so we decided we need, really needed to utilize them. So we created these playlists. Here's our a picture of our database. So these are some of our Italian songs. Uh, we had a whole bunch of Chinese Mandarin uh, from China and Taiwan, um, from some Cantonese songs, French songs from around the world, Tagalog. Um, and once we had these da this database created, we started to make the playlist on Spotify and YouTube, and we were able to share them with all the staff at all the sites. So our next step in this one, in this project here is to continue to build a library of playlists from around the world and ask some of our members and families to help us in building that. Shannon and Jesswan had an initiative that they wanted to work on that was twofold. So we're gonna just talk about the first part because um, they wanted to get more musical information from our members as they came into the day program. Currently when members come into the day program, they're assessed by management and um, then families are asked to complete a leisure summary that has all person-centered information uh, on their past, present and current hobbies and um, uh, things they like to do. So the old leisure summary only had a couple questions about music, you know, it was like, do you like music? Yes or no. Do you play an instrument? Yes or no. Yeah, that kind of thing. So together, um, Shannon and Jesswan created a little mini committee where they wanted, to, where they re-looked at the leisure summary. And this is the proposed new section of the leisure summary that committee brought um, that the committee brought forward. I love this one question where they ask about songs and um, can't even read it songs genres or artists that are a trigger. Um, the, our our teams really understand how important it is to know um, if someone has a trigger, and they know the importance of um, knowing that music can be a trigger. Um, so asking a family if they know that, that could really help us. So um, this part, this part um, once, they, once the Jesslan and Shannon looked at this um, and cre recreated this part, they actually didn't stop and they recreated the whole entire leisure summary. And it's now um, in uh, man management team has it and they're reviewing it to see if we're going to start using that hopefully in the next little while for our members. Um, so our little music committee has already achieved a lot. <laughs> now this picture, I love this picture because this is supposed to be nine different images. Um, 
And I think it perfectly shows how our music library inventory and ideas were prior to having a music committee. We have, you know, a great sing along at site A, at, at, at maybe Brampton, a staff member created a new sing along, the ABBA sing along. But we have whole new instruments at, at our Sam McCallion site. And our site at C, uh, at our other site has a, you know, great music crossword program they've created. And everything was just all over the place. So one of the big things we wanted to accomplish was we wanted to bring everything together. So we created a shared Google Drive. And if you've, any of you have worked in a Google Drive, you know that when you put files in there, it's just a mess. Like there's, you know, there's multiple versions of files, the permissions, it just ended up this big disaster. So I then got discovered Google Sites and I created this music hub. Now this hub is a huge project and I don't suggest everyone put in the effort and the, like to put something together like this because this is probably too much, but bringing all your resources, ideas, and programs together in one place is a huge way of uniting your team. Having one place with everything musical on hand for easy access is incredibly helpful. Just, you know, that's the music area. That's where you're going to go and get everything, whether it's a Google Drive, um, you know, whether it's a shelf, whether it's a, cup, a cupboard or a cabinet, just having everything together um, has been really helpful for us. So we created, this is the site that I created. So it's a Google site and it's available to all ASP staff. It's controlled by the music committee. So we all have access to it, but only some sections are available for the committee members. So in this music headquarters area, this is where a description of music therapy, the music therapy process, the program descriptions, the referral forms and everything is under this page. Music committee section has our meeting minutes, our schedule, a list of committee members. There's the personalized playlist section. So this has the instructions on how to create personalized playlists, our shared playlists, the forms we use to create our playlists and all the multicultural playlists. I think I've ever said playlists that often in a sentence. <laughs> all our multicultural playlists, everything's in there. Memories to Music section has all our forms, all the songs, everything, Memories to Music in it. And this music programming section has a whole page dedicated to music therapy programs created by myself, my, our YouTube music therapy channel, resources for our virtual programs, third party resources, and a section for staff to go when I'm away. So here's the music therapist absence section. So if I'm away, not all staff are comfortable with running music programs. So these are the resources they can use. They can find slideshows, which are based on a theme such as like, there might be a, a spring theme and it has spring song and then some discussion questions. Um, the music trivia has music, um, uh, music, information uh all music trivia on the website that staff can just get at and the music bingo has the music cards the playlists all that information just in one place so that they can all get that too so here's an example of the music trivia page with just pdfs that everyone can go to and have access to so this hub is really uniting all the music resources in one place and it continues to grow uh, especially now that staff are back at the site having not been there since march 2020 we're able to really see what our resources are and bring them together there are unfortunately, of course, a few initiatives that we haven't been able to do because of COVID, but we have some great plans. <laughs> Melissa and Amanda both want to create an intergenerational choir with a local elementary school. Um, so once all the restrictions are over, I'm hoping that they can come together and they can create this and I can be that voice to help them in whatever way they need um, so that they can create this. Um, Claudia wants to bring back the bell choir. So again, um, we're gonna we're gonna figure out how to do that. Um, Maria wants to do the drum circle, and it's the same thing. So I know how to do both of those. How can I help the, um, my colleagues do it? So whether it's that we put together a training session, whether we run it together, so that you know, um, the uh, the uh, client service workers. Sorry, they just changed their their title. Client service workers can run these programs while I'm not there, and not every day not only the day that Ruth's there, that won't be just a music day. And I can focus on doing some more of the clinical work within the day programs with clients who um, are ex you know, experiencing you know, a little more trouble with adjusting to the day program or need a little more one-on-one -on -one or won't participate in any other programs. And then these other music programs can be there for everyone else. 
the staff have already <laughs> amazed me um, from what they've learned um, from some of the training and what they want decided that they want to do. Um, one of the staff uh, created a humming choir. She's um, she knows about how important humming can be and um, how many of our members can hum the mel melodies and not the words. So she's come up with a whole um, slideshow where it's the music and she encourages the members to hum along with the music. Um, and someone else has an instrument band where they were able to buy all these instruments because we can't sing as much in the day program so now we can put these instruments we can wipe down and we can use them in the day program so what how can we use them what what can we do do we do we you know just randomly play them or can we create some kind of band with these instruments so we're going to start working on that we're meeting tomorrow about it um so this the my my colleagues in the day program are coming up with these ideas outside the box that you know, two years ago, they never would have thought of because, well, that was, you know, maybe that was my job or, you know, they're, but they're just, they're empowered to come up with their own ideas. And it's my role to help bring those ideas to life in any way that I can. Um, I, it's just, as you can tell, I'm very excited about it. <laughs> um, so some future extensions we're looking at is over the summer, we want some new developments. Um, we had some new developments. So the BSO, the Behavioral Supports Ontario team, came to me and wanted to talk about personalized playlists. So I told them about our multicultural playlist project. And so they were super excited about that. They want to get involved. We also would love to train our community support workers and our behavioral support counselors on how to make the playlist so they can make them and they can share them with family members who are struggling at home or struggling with transitions or struggling at long-term cares. You know, how can we use these, this music that we have at our fingertips? How can we use it in the best way? Uh, we also are working on, this is the second part to Shannon and Jess Swan's initiative. What they would love to do is that every time a member comes into a day, the day program, a playlist is created for them. So that would mean a staff member sits down with that, that client, talks with them, figures out what their favorite music is, creates a playlist. What better way to get to know someone and make someone feel like they're being you know, listened to and that they're connecting with the people in this new place, in this new world that they don't, you know, in this new day program, which they might be a little scared of or nervous about or hesitant. Um, I think it's such a great idea. We have yet to roll this out, but it, all, the, all the ideas are buzzing there. So this is gonna be um, something that we hope to, you know, bring, bring forward in the future. And I know I've thrown <laughs> so much at you here today. <laughs> I'm very excited about my program, our programs, I know. But as a quick summary of our quick tips, the things that I've learned over the last 17 years, that hopefully it won't take you 17 years, apply for grants and the sponsorships to help fund a community program, something that's forward facing that makes people's hearts warm and fuzzy. Support from stakeholders, your senior leadership team, your CEO, your supervisors, prominent community members, anything like that is imperative to getting that support and can, you know, getting that, 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 um, yeah, getting that support from, from, and for the, for your music community. Collecting evidence of the effect of the program is having on your participants. So get photos, get information, get testimonials, people who are really loving it, capture all those little moments. Involving like-minded music colleagues, utilizing the enthusiasm of others to work together to achieve greatness is, is huge. Like that passion, people are passionate about music. Get people together who, who all feel the same way. Encourage music to be a topic of discussion throughout your organization. So standing items on meetings, you know, little in-services, presentations, anything to get that, you know, it, it in the forefront of people. It's not just something, you know, that they do over there. It's always a part of, of, of just general every day. Education on the fundamentals of music and the power of music is key to empowering others. This one's huge. I missed it for about 15 years. <laughs> Doesn't everybody know? <laughs> um, creating a music committee where you bring those like-minded people together has been so exciting in this last year, uh, couple of years. Having a music expert, ideally someone with formal training, music therapist or a music care practitioner, someone like that who is able to, you know, um, be the resource for the rest of the team has been incredibly important. 
Having a music headquarters that houses all music resources could be a shelf or a cabinet, something just where you bring everything together. It's super important. Everything's super important. I keep saying that. Creating a music community takes time and dedication. It's taken six, 17 years for us to get here. It doesn't happen overnight, but it, and it, but it can happen. It can happen small, just small steps. And then it'll, you know, the momentum of, of it will just, will just build on itself, get other people passionate about it and enthusiastic about it. And it'll just, it'll, it'll evolve. And this is so key for me. Music doesn't belong to one person. It doesn't belong to the music therapist, or it doesn't belong to the music practitioner. It doesn't belong to the expert. It belongs to everybody. We have to empower everyone to use it in a day to day in all their day in everyone's position everybody can use it in all their lines of work and we need and that's what that's that's, that's just the summary of <laughs> i don't know how to finish now uh, that's just how i <laughs> that's just my last little word there <laughs> the terrible ending <laughs> not a terrible ending at all ruth actually i must say i'm i'm really overwhelmed and and just overjoyed with the information you've shared with everyone um i'm going to invite any questions right now before we sort of i have a few questions myself but if if people want to you can turn your cameras back on if you feel comfortable send a message in the chat and and i will um i really heard your your uh sort of epiphany about education. So I did put, um, I mentioned it at the beginning, but sort of to give reference, um, we do offer our music care training. I put a link to it in the chat. You can also look at uh, musiccare.org, our new website. Um, but the training that she's talking about, I think is is the level one training, right? The music care level, level one. Um, and so again, I've put a link to that specifically in the chat. And I mean, again, before I ask some questions, are there any questions in the chat that people have about any questions at all for Ruth? Well, I guess I have a question. And so, and I know it might be a basic question, but what would your advice be in terms of people starting? Like, you know, you the programs, you know, you had many programs, many ideas. If somebody um, is looking for something that is a real, like dipping your toe in the water and starting the conversations or, or something, what, what would you suggest? What's an easy way to start? That's a very good question, Don. Um, I started, you know, um, just doing, music therapy programs in the day program but the real big thing that started for us um in that 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 creating of the community was was the memories to music in 2009 so it was that community project that really you know other people could see right to get that support it was that it was that contact of like contacting the ceo or you know that that to the stakeholders to the big guys really to get so that they were like hey you know this isn't just someone singing right like it's bigger than that um so i would say you know that's like look into grants it is a buzzword look into something if you wanted to provide a little choir or if you wanted to i mean i know it's not the greatest time right now but <laughs> you got some time to plan <laughs> Well, and I know the Sound Connections program, just because, you know, I worked in a different context with you, was built out of taking opportunity in, in a virtual world. There is, speaking of virtual, um, in my personal, there's a message. It says uh, to you, the website you made for ASP looked hard to make. Any ideas for those of us who don't know how to make websites? You know, um, this Google site, I'm not, it didn't build this website. It's a free service already within like if your work has a google account kind of thing so all our asp emails are through that so it already is there um so it was a free and you just like drag and drop so and i've got a little bit of help from it so it has been a lot easier than it looks it looks a little more impressive than it was um but that's why it's like even a binder like those pathways programs i've created binders with 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 printouts so that people can pull them out you know and just like what i said even just a shelf where you have stuff there um and even a google drive which always ends up being a mess it's something right so it, it doesn't have to be something that complicated <laughs> well and just i think um 
just on a basic level, if, if you have Google, there's the kind of waffle beside your icon. And if you, I don't know if people have opened it, but there's that like waffle grid and that's where you get the Google sites, right? Like that's yeah. where you built it from. So yeah. I, I know that's a basic, but if that's what somebody was asking, I know, you know, and that's where you'll get, you know, your G drive and the Google sites and all that sort of thing. So maybe that's a great way to start. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, and then I guess the conversation, are there, how did you um, just around the organization or virtually, uh, maybe, maybe in a virtual space, how did you get the messages out for what you were doing? Like I know at, in, when we're in a space, there's community bulletin boards and, and there's different places like that to advertise your programs. Is there, how did you keep connected about what you were doing through this time? Through the, through, through COVID virtual time? Yes, yeah. Um, it was, it's been a challenge. Um, one, of, one of the I, things was that we were able to, um, you know, like lots of meetings, virtual meetings, you know, like this kind of thing, but then putting clips on, on to get the publicity out there is lots of, you know, um, tweeting and Facebooking and posting stuff like that from, from our, our uh, I guess our PR team or whatever it is like them they've been very diligent on putting that putting it on our our websites that kind of stuff too um because yeah it's it's been hard yeah so that publicity that you were talking about which is also important for grants and for starting and for the ask uh social media probably or, or having a window out or showing what the work that you're doing was probably helpful in that regard yeah absolutely yeah, excellent um, do you have any um, any final comment as we end our day? I mean, I know I, I loved the your approach all the way through, and it it really is something I took away from it on um, on how it's for everyone, right? You know, you can really develop the sense of community that it's not about talent and and who has the best singing voice and all that sort of stuff, but it's about a committee of people working on you know on one point together. Sorry, I. I read the message and then I listened to your last part and I totally missed the first part of what you said, Dawn. <laughs> <That's> so, <sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question that came in on the message and then I read that and I was like, oh no, I'm not listening. <laughs> no, that you're just proving actually exactly. I do the same thing. So yeah, no, it, I guess uh, it's fine. It's just more, um, of getting the message and building the community it's not talent based it's you know that committee of people that you had and that you developed was really not about who's the best musician but about sharing the message of music itself the passion the enthusiasm and the passion is is the key as long as you have that and you can work together you can you know figure out the other stuff right and can I ask just as we as we close, is there a favorite memory you, you shared a lot of you shared a lot of great moments and great programs, but from to, to end on a very uh, inspiring, you know, note, uh, not that we aren't already inspired, but is there one kind of nugget that you would share that stands out as a as a really key memory. Apart from my experiences with members, it would be feeding off the encouragement of, 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 of the, my colleagues, like them coming to me and saying, I want to do this and how can we do it? And, and that reversal of like, of them coming to me, like that has been, I think, so exciting for me is it's not like it's, it's growing, like the, the wealth is growing, like we're, we're just working so much together rather than it just I, I don't feel so alone, you know, like I, I'm, I'm the only music therapist with all these people and, and I, I feel so don't feel so alone. I feel like we're working together. It's, it's just been, I think that's been the most exciting part for me. That's, that's awesome. And on that note, uh, just a uh, uh, Marion thankfully has put in the uh, chat just information on how to get a certi uh, certificate of participation um, for attending today's webinar, as well as uh, Ruth's quick tips via email, which are there's some gems in there uh, as we were watching. So I think on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for sharing today. And uh, for everybody else, don't forget that we have a webinar in two weeks about our Music Care Connect app. Uh, which is, again, normally we schedule every second Wednesday, but Kenna is going to be walking us through uh, the new Music Care Connect app. There, and there is a free 30-day trial. Um, so we can take a piece out of your book, Ruth, 
and use the Connect app in trying to develop some of our own playlists. So thank you very much. Thank you.